so um, you guys, I'm going to go ahead and get us started and welcome everyone who is joining us here tonight. I'm so happy to be here with you. I'm Renee Casterline with the Siskiyou Land Trust. Um, many of you may know that the Land Trust typically does a winter slideshow series at this time of year. And so we are adjusting uh, to COVID times by doing our, um, a webinar series online. I want to turn this over to Bill Meese, who I met many, 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 many years ago, uh, very briefly in the Mount Shasta collection room at College of the Siskiyous where Bill was undoubtedly doing research because he's done so much of it and um, put so much attention towards this area, Mount Shasta, that we live in and understanding its history and documenting its history. Uh, Bill's the um, author of the annotated bibliography of Mount Shasta, as well as the art of Mount Shasta, Sudden and Solitary. Those two books, if you don't have them at home, are really a way for you to dig in, uh, to learn more beyond what Bill shares with us tonight. And uh, for those of you who enjoy research, an opportunity to just find your own rabbit hole to go down to, um, to learn more about, about Mount Shasta. So um, with that brief introduction to Bill, what I want to do now is turn it over to him so that he can share his material and his stories, his expertise with us. So Bill, I wanna say thank you so much again for being here with us tonight. And at this point, I will turn it over to you. Great, <clears throat> well, thanks so much for the opportunity to get really befuddled by all of this stuff here. Uh, I hope everybody enjoys this. It's a visual show, which is great. It's not kind of dry material. It's not poems or literature. Uh, I'm gonna start the slide. I don't need to do much more than this. I have to move my little chat box out that I'm learning about. So today we're going to call this Lost Legacy 180 Years of Mount Shasta Art. It's really a couple of, of legacies we're going to talk about. I just wanted to show this from 2010. This was the entrance to the exhibition of art of Mount Shasta that we put on at Turtle Bay Museum. And all these paintings are from the 19th century and that's gonna be part of, of this lost legacy. Here in 1841, there was an expedition that went around the world for four years and they sent an overland expedition down um, over the Siskiyou summit towards um, Sutter's Fort in the Sacramento Valley. And they had a very famous man who was to become very famous, founded the system of minerals if anybody's into crystals, Dana's system of mineralogy is still used today worldwide. So he was a young man, young geologist, and um, he wrote this in 1841. He said, Mount Shasta is another of these hoary summits, like hoarfrost, the whiteness. A heavy mist covered the region as we approached it, gazing up intently for the peak, visible in the early part of the day. We barely discovered some lights and shades far above us, which produced through the indefiniteness of view, a vision of immensity such as pertains to the vast universe rather than to our own planet. And it's that thing about, about the immensity of Mount Shasta and the universe and one being a symbol for the other. It's an amazing visual experience that people have when they come to Mount Shasta. And artists, more than anyone, try to, to work with that, that experience of, of the, the hugeness of it. So today we're gonna to have a little introduction and then we're gonna do um, a lost legacy that I call lost legacy. It's, it's something quite amazing uh, of two Native Americans that lived in the Dunsmuir area at the turn of the century and later. And then we'll go on to the uh, San Francisco art boom where most of these pictures come from. There's literally many hundreds of Mount Shasta paintings that were produced in 1968 to time period. Then the Wilkes Expedition which produced the very first pictures and another lost legacy there because these people were responsible for the founding of the Smithsonian Institution. Their collections from four years were, were um, needed to be housed somewhere and the Smithson money from England that was given to the US, they built um, you know, all the collection uh, areas for all this, these materials. 
Um, and so much science came out of that. America's greatest scientific exploration that nobody's ever heard of. It's really another loss of legacy. And then finally, we're gonna do um, something I just learned about two weeks ago, the naming of the Whitney Glacier. And I had always thought it was in honor of, of, Jane, of Whitney, the, the famous California, head of the California Geological Survey. Um, this painting by Alfonso Broad was done around 1890 or so. And it was hanging in Halford's antique shop here in Mount Shasta back in 1986 when I bought this. And there's a little story behind it and it kind of got me interested in, in many respects into the art world of Mount Shasta art. So I had never bought a painting before. This was hanging there. I went inside and I said to the woman that was a partner of the Halfords at the time. And I said, boy, that's a great, how much is it? And she said, oh, it's $400. And I said, woo, it's too much. I'll give you 200. And she said, well, the frames were 200 alone. And I said, fine, I'll give you 200, just take the painting, I don't want the frame. And she got real miffed at that and I don't blame her a bit in retrospect. So I brought this painting home, it was wrapped up and I took it into my living room and um, the light was good and everything. And I held it in my hands and it actually did that kind of thing that that some of those 3D pictures have. If you stare at them and cross your eyes, all of a sudden everything comes three dimensional. Well, that happened with this painting. And it may not look like that to you, you know, on the screen right here, but it happened to me and it was a marvelous experience. It was like something I had never anticipated or experienced before. And I said, wow, now I get it why people like art. It does things, it's great. And then I thought, well, maybe this is the very first picture of Mount Shasta ever done. It looked really old to me. So I went to the library a couple of weeks later and uh, there was a new dictionary, a big encyclopedia of Mount of, of California arts, two big volumes. And I looked up Alfonso Broad and it said, yeah, he was uh, a friend of William Keith, the great painter. He was a trustee. This man was a trustee of uh, city of Berkeley. He was an architect, built schools and homes and we've build alcoves in the homes and he would put, put his paintings in those alcoves in the home he would build. And then it said he's noted for his green apple color. You can kind of see that in this picture. And then it says, and he was really well known for his hand carved frames, which I didn't have. And that really ticked me off too. I was like, oh, I really messed up there. So I went back and I did buy the frame and everything was happily ever after. But it taught me a lot of things. One, um, frames are important. Two, that paintings can be magical. And three, as I started looking through this dictionary, that there were an awful lot of paintings of Mount Shasta out there. So here's a couple of them on the wall from that exhibition. This one on the right was loaned by the Bancroft Library. It's a great rare book library um, since late 1800s at UC Berkeley. And you could go into the reading room and I did do go to the reading room there and wanted to look up some history of Mount Shasta art. And then on the walls, there were paintings of Mount Shasta. It's just absolutely serendipitous and really neat. So, at about the same time, I had seen all these paintings, started doing a little research, trying to figure out, well, if my painting's not the first one, which was the earliest one? And there was no real rhyme nor reason um, other, other than I got the collecting bug, and I'll show you why in, in a minute. But at the same time that, that I started this project, I had seen several hundred pictures of Mount Shasta already. This final environmental impact statement came out in 1988 for the Mount Shasta ski area. And they had a page and a half about the history of Mount Shasta. And it said basically no history of any importance on Mount Shasta. No buildings of importance, architecture, no battles took place, no big events took place. Therefore, a negative declaration. No history, no problem. Go build your, your ski area. And it took me, I don't know, it took me months before I finally figured out that what was missing was looking at the mountain as a whole, as a resource for inspiration. That was a history that I could document. And so I went ahead and I documented, and I wrote a book, um, finished in 1989, and I called it The Significance of Mount Shasta as a Visual Resource in 19th and early 20th century California art. And it's got all these um, different chapters, the San Francisco art boom, which we'll talk about today, the railroad artists, the early expeditions, the watercolorists, the women artists, um, visionary artists, all kinds of chapters, like 150 pages or so. So I did that and I'm really proud of it. And 
I gave it to the lawyers who were working these these cases, um, and it helped. Um, you know, turn some minds around and they sent up a team of historians from the Forest Service to spend two weeks in the special collections uh, under uh, the College of the City run by Dennis Freeman. Most of you know who he is. He's the um, former chief librarian at College of the Siskiyous and he'd been collecting all this um, history of Mount Shasta for 30 years at that time, maybe 10 or 15. So, so I wrote that book 20 years later, that was 1989. In 2008, well, actually a couple of years earlier, Robin Peterson down there at the bottom um, was the chief head of uh, exhibitions at Turtle Bay Museum. And I had sold Turtle Bay and the, the former museum, all the paintings that I had collected in 1993, I sold um, my collection to them. Well, anyway, in 2007, 2008, she approached me and said, you know, we got to do a book on this stuff. This is just too amazing. So she took the book and kind of rewrote it in her own language and, um, I supplied all the references to all these other pictures around the country. This is a, a wonderful one from about 1880 or so by uh, a man named Yellen, who was a professor of drawing in uh, San Francisco back in the late 1800s. And um, so that was the book. It kind of came out of the earlier paper. So as lone as God and white as a winter moon, Mount Shasta starts up sudden and solitary. That's where the title of the art book comes from, from the heart of the great black forests of Northern California. And as I was saying, the picture interested me because it was an early, obviously an early picture. And it turned out that it actually was an engraving made from this painting by Frederick Putman. And he was one of the two or three earliest of the what we call early California artists. San Francisco art boom started around 1860. And um, this man, Frederick Butman, and really what these people were beginning to do was to capture, you know, this vastness. That was, that was a tough trick. And this painting actually, although it may look funny to you as, as small, um, you know, peak of Shastina and, and a little awkward feel, that's true of a lot of paintings. And it, it's hard to explain it, but oftentimes they were seeing what they saw. And, and actually, if you look through kind of a unprejudiced view driving down I-5, for example, you'll see that the mountain can look like this at times. It's pretty amazing. So anyway, that was, you know, you can kind of see if you look up in the center here, you can see the peak and then go back to the picture and you can kind of see that this is an engraving made from this painting. And it says in the book, it says it by Frederick Putman. So um, the segue here to the Native Americans is this little um, smoke here. Miller's camp is kind of portrayed there and he lived with his Indian wife on the other side actually in the cloud area for a year back in the 1850s. Um, the segue is into the Native American artists. And I'm gonna go from the ancient caves up at the Modoc lava beds to Talandali to La Pena, these two artists from Dunsmuir and the book called The World is a Gift. And you may not know, this is kind of one of those lost legacies that I'm trying to communicate. So the next slide, you gotta be prepared for this. It's a little disorienting. Look at the bottom of the picture and you'll see the floor and then you'll get an idea of um, the setting. This is Fern Cave up at the Modoc Lava Beds and it's only open to the public once in a while. I've never been in it, I'd love to. And I want you to look where my cursor is if you can. You can kind of see these rays coming from a central figure here. Those are the, the images that I now have an explanation for based upon the tradition from Grant Towndolly and Frank Le Pena. So this is Grant Towndolly. He's born 1873. Um, 1863 he was born there under the bridge at Dunsmuir at the old Upper Soda Springs. His family came over. They were chased out by the miners from the uh, Trinity area, Trinity River area. And uh, he's the namesake of Mount Dolly Park under the bridge there in Dunsmuir. And the city of Mount Shasta honored him in 1947 for bridging the gap between the Indian world and the white world. And um, he was really quite a guy, highly educated um, intellect. He, um, he painted, you know, that's an odd thing, he painted in the Western, you know, European tradition. So how did that happen? How did he start to paint? It's kind of an odd thing for an Indian man to be painting. Well, it turns out in 1908, Grant Towndolly was a mountain guide and took some climbers from UC Berkeley to the summit of Mount Shasta. And amongst them was the E.W. Courier, an artist from San Francisco, 
same year, 1908. And this is a painting by Courier from 1908. And if you look between the two and look in the upper left, or look at the peak, that little peak at the summit there, and you can see the same little peak, you know, and it's pretty much the same place they're painting from. So it's pretty obvious that Courier, because he was painting the same year and had been with Town Dolly, that Grant Town Dolly learned to paint from Courier. And that's pretty cool. So we can kind of explain some of the process that an artist got his training for. And there are five or six of these paintings by Talon Dolly out there. I've seen two or three of them myself. So Talon Dolly was an important man and his teaching stories for the young, young Indians were compiled back in the 1960s by Marcel Masson, the Masson family who owned Upper Soda Springs. And the bag of bones refers to this rock on Salt Creek off of the Sacramento River down by Gibson. These are legends of the Wintu Indians. And she, the, the editor says, Grant had been trained by his father for leadership, a preparation which included learning the myths and legends of his people. And an important point, the correct way to narrate them. So the stories are wonderful. They're a little difficult to read for a Westerner, but they have a power that that gives you a sense of what, what a life was like in these woods. It's great. So Frank LaPena was the nephew of Grand Town Dolly. And Frank LaPena became a professor of Native American studies at Sacramento State University and became an internationally known artist. And you've probably seen this picture that he's done. This is one of the most printed graphics of Mount Shasta there is by Frank LaPena. What you might not know is that this image was done in honor of his uncle when his uncle died. And it's printed up in this book called The World is a Gift, Limestone Press, 1987. And what it means, if you look at the bottom here, when my uncle died, I went to Mount Shasta with a bundle of my hair that I had cut off as a sign of mourning. Mount Shasta is the last place on earth the spirit visits before traveling to the above world. The cutting of the hair is a sign of grievance and respect. So, you know, it was so meaningful when his uncle died that Frank did this whole honoring. And the, the thing about the book, this book called The World is a Gift, it's a leaved artiste. That's a French term used in English to signify an artist's book where they do a prints and, and text. And this book is probably, in my opinion, the best teaching environmental sensitivity book there can be. It's just unbelievably wonderful. There's eight prints, each one's got a story, two stories simultaneous, one on the top, one on the bottom of each page. And it says here, and this is from page one, the world is a gift from our old ones. This sacred gift was created through love and respect by those elders who understood the beauty of their surroundings. Their understanding encompassed the total meaning of life within their environment. The old ones paid close attention to the sacred earth and to all nature. They were involved with the mysterious and magical dimensions of reality. The evidence for the representation of the earth as a mystical magical place was given embodiment through the experience of those who made visits to sacred places. The power of knowledge was revealed to medicine people and traditionalists involved in its pursuit. We respect those thoughts and teachings. When we are forgetful and need reminding of those teachings, they are given back to us in our dreams. So Frank LaPena, and it's Mount Shasta, this is called We Are All Sacred. Um, it's pretty well known print. It's, it's a big lithograph. It's, you know, it's three or four feet wide, it's huge. And the dancers and those rays coming off. Frank LaPena was a dancer. And he says in an interview, and I, I made some reference notes, you can look up later uh, when this is posted as a video, that um, Frank LaPena gave an interview last year, This he died last year too, he gave an interview and he talks about how the, the settlers and the white men, they couldn't understand the religion at all. They had no idea that you have to do the dances, you have to do the songs in order to enter into those magical realms. And the dress, the headdress, so Frank LaPena was part of this news from Native California. These rays coming out here, I'm still good. This is called Big Head that comes from the world as gift. These rays coming out, to me, they signify um, the invisible world. 
at this point, my best way to put it, the connectedness between all things and into the spiritual realms. You can go into that space behind the image of the head here. Um, he, he, Frank's a little more graphic here where he says, gatekeepers of the invisible. These are the peoples. This is his clan, the bear clan, the dog clan, the bee clans. Um, and this symbol with these rays coming out from a central sun, that's what I think these symbols are a continuation of, you know, these, they, these are the beginning and those are the endings or they come round and round. Hard to say, it's just, I find it very difficult to understand symbols like you see in these cave paintings. And I think now, at least when I see these symbols, I can think of those, that headdress and that experience of connecting to the other world through the dancing and through the music. I think that's pretty cool. It gives me an interpretation of these cave paintings. So that's it for that. Um, I think it's pretty neat. So the San Francisco Art Boom, 1860, 1890. I'm gonna to try to explain where all these paintings came from, how come. So William Keith was kind of called the Dean of San Francisco um, painters back in 1860, 1870, 1880, 1890. He was a very popular painter, made a lot of money. Here's a painting of his in Mount Shasta. He's kind of reminiscing here around 1900 or so in his studio. Look at all the paints because I got something to show you later. Um, he's, he's a painter and he's selling paintings. He's, he's um, John Muir's best friend. The two of them would travel together for 30 years or so. Um, and he was asked in 1895 to reminisce, to go back, and what was it like during that San Francisco art boom? And this kind of explains what happened. It says, everything and anything in the semblance of a picture sold then, the 1870s, an art wave swept over California. I shall stick to the word now. He's talking about art because some of it was schlock art in his opinion. And everybody bought pictures. Those were the halcyon days for painters in this city. The people had money, had more of it than they needed, so they bought artworks generously. I like to dwell upon those days because San Francisco artists found home appreciation then, and what is better, a home market. The wealthy people of California bought pictures painted by California artists. The country was young then, and the men could see the poetry and romance and the art that lay at their own doors. And so the idea here is really that a, Californians wanted to patronize California artists and forget about the East Coast. It was kind of, you know, a rivalry. And so they had the money and they had the artists and people could paint hundreds of Mount Shasta paintings or Yosemite paintings and sell them, which they did. What's so cool is that those paintings are oftentimes still around. Now, the impetus in 1863 by Albert Bierstadt, he gave this great impetus to other artists because Bierstadt was the most famous artist um, in America at the time. And they gave him the first ticker tape parade in New York City. It was for Albert Bierstadt coming back from this trip in 1863, um, across the continent it was called. So Bierstadt came and he painted Mount Shasta and that gave, you know, kind of set the bar for who would paint Mount Shasta. So I'm gonna explain a little bit why I got so interested in all this material. Um, and it, it had to do with this painting just a little painting on paper by Albert Bierstadt. I think I have, um, this is actual photograph. I don't know if I can go backwards, yeah. So in 1863, Bierstadt travels across the continent, comes up from San Francisco with his partner, traveling partner, Fitzhugh Ludlow, known as a drug user. He wrote the book, um, The Hashish Eater. He was quite a druggie and a good writer. And so he wrote, monthly chapters for the Atlantic Monthly Magazine. Well, I had been looking for paintings for about a year or less, about six months or so. And a man called me up and said, I have a painting by Albert Bierstadt for you. And I said, oh, that's cool. I'd like to see it. He said, yeah, it's for sale. I said, well, how much is it? He said, $35,000. Uh, oh, you know, just if I had coffee, I would have spilled it. So I said, well, thank you very much, but could you send me a, I'd like to see it. And it was before the internet. And he, so he sent me the picture. And two months later, you know, I looked at this picture. I thought it was pretty cool, but you know, not worth thirty-five thousand dollars. So I went to San Francisco and I found an art gallery down there that specializes in this kind of art. And this painting was on the wall. And I said to the owner, "Oh, there's that thirty-five thousand dollar painting." And he said, "Oh, no, 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 it's eighty-five thousand dollars." 
And I kind of was stunned. And I said, how can you add $50,000 to a painting's value? And he explained to me that this painting was the only picture from this trip by Albert Bierstadt to be in existence. There's records of Bierstadt painting dozens of sketches around Mount Shasta, but none had ever appeared. Its rarity was known by this art dealer who was a historian. And I finally figured out that that's what art historians do. They add value to things. They figure out what the story is behind the picture. So it was, it was a big introduction to this world of collectors and had a good time with it. Um, and you know, I, I missed my big chance there, but you know, over the years I'd found many paintings and then by the 1993 or so I had a collection of paintings and I sold it to uh, uh, the uh, Reading Museum of Art and History at the time. And they still have those paintings and, and everybody was happy and it worked out pretty well. So Bierstadt uh, traveled with Fitzhugh Ludlow and uh, you know some of the things he said, for example, certainly no peak which we met in all our large experience of the mountains of this continent ever compared with Shasta in producing the effect of vast height. Bierstadt's color box of Fuller by a score of Shasta studies taken under every possible variety of position, sky, and time of day. And, and I wrote this little comment here, Bierstadt's heavy suitcase of oil paints caused the two much trouble and the extra weight was hard on their horses too. Ludlow remarked that the man who first called chrome and white lead light colors must have been indulging the subtle irony of a diseased mind. That's typical Ludlow writing. So last thing about this trip in 1863, you know, kind of getting a, you know, a, a side thing. For me, I like the bigger issues. So the local history aspects aren't quite as important to me, but I found this to be fascinating. Sisson was, without exception, the best rifle shot I ever saw. A first class woodsman, keen sight for game and covert, and soft footedness in sealing on it, to a degree so unequaled in my acquaintance that I feel justified in calling him not only the best shot, but the best hunter I ever knew. We spent three days in exploring, sketching, and deer stalking with him, during all of which time he was never once taken by surprise, but invariably cracked it over before ourselves or another old huntsman with us had time to say, where is it? So yeah, interesting um, you know, insight or at least a look from people that knew Sisson because you hear that name, the town of Mount Shasta used to be called Sisson up till the 1924 time period. Um, and here's somebody that actually you know, went hunting with Sisson and talked about it. So pretty amazing. Now in 1872, Bierstadt came did this painting. This one also was an expensive painting. It's a two hundred thousand dollar painting, and um, I, you know, I talked to the owners of the painting as a gallery in New York City. Told them it was not the Wind River Range in I think Wyoming that they thought it was. That that's what their expert told them, and so they promptly bumped the price up to three hundred fifty thousand dollars. It was unbelievable. So that's the most expensive painting I've ever seen of Mount Shasta. Um, at this time, there was another man, there was Butman and Wandesford and Bierstadt, all in 1863, 1864. They kind of, this is, uh, if you look at all this atmospheric work here of clouds, it's difficult to do. And the Hudson's um, River School of Art, loosely called, you know, a school of art, they would work these kind of, you know, atmospheric effects. And Wandesford was an Englishman who came to California after the gold rush and um, he became one of the leaders of this San Francisco art boom. And this uh, again looks so high, but there's, I swear there's days when I've seen it that way. Great, great painting, a lot of uh, interesting horses and, and uh, people, lots of water. If you're interested in what the foliage was like on the Shasta River area at this time, even the hummocks. So there's a lot in this. So, you had these early artists, Butman, Wandesford, Bierstadt, but the two main people were William Keith and Thomas Hill, and each of them did probably 40 to 50 Mount Shasta paintings, which is a theme about all these early artists that were successful. They often painted dozens and dozens of Mount Shasta pictures. This is Sissons by William Keith. Um, that's the, the home there. This is in Keith's studio. This is Keith, you know, they're probably 1900 or so. Um, this is John Muir, the two of them were buddies. This is Key Studio. You can see the paintings on the floor. Sierra Club was founded in Key Studio, the meetings that they had weekly between Muir and, uh, 
and Keith in San Francisco. And this is John Burroughs in the frontier. And this is Charles Keeler, head of the California Academy of Sciences. This is a publisher from back east somewhere. I'm not sure his name. John Burroughs was a famous East Coast uh, naturalist. Here's one of my favorite paintings. Uh, this is of Mount Shasta by William Keith. And I found this one just lying in the back of a storeroom down in Pasadena. I was having lunch and I saw a gallery across the street and I asked them if they had any Mount Shasta paintings. He said, no, but we're having an exhibition upstairs. So as I was walking by on a landing up the stairs, I looked over and I saw this painting face up, just uh, leaning against a bunch of other paintings. So he didn't, owner didn't know really what it was. And, and uh, I told him it was Mount Shasta, but it still was, was a great, um, find for me. This is a sketch. Oakland Museum has sketchbooks of William Keith. And this is kind of the same rocks and, and view of the river from which that painting that we just saw was made. It's kind of central. This, I would say this, um, this rock here kind of fits this rock here. So these artists would, would take the sketches back often and paint in the studio. This is Mount Shasta on the upper left there. You can see Shastina with a little peak. Um, I put this in here, it's not a little hard, but he's got color notes. You do see, here it says yellow. He, so he'd do color notes and then uh, be able to kind of know what effects he was looking for. This was interesting. This um, came up for sale two weeks ago in, um, I think, at Christie's in New York City. It's a $70,000, $100,000 painting. It didn't sell. I was really hopefully, hope, hoping it would, would have sold, but I think um, the times are, you know, times aren't right. This was um, T. Boone's Pickens collection. He owned this. He was a famous oil uh, um, baron of sorts in modern times. He passed away a few years ago, and this was in his collection. Mostly it was pictures of, of Native Americans and um, oil fields. Another Keith painting, just to show you another Keith painting, another Keith painting, just to kind of show you another Keith painting. Um, maybe a hundred of them out there. I don't know if Mount Jasta. This is a big one that was in our exhibition in 2010. Sorry, the picture's not so good, but you can kind of get the size of the scale. And this belonged to the Jonathan Club. It went into their building in downtown Los Angeles in two, 1915. And then in 2008, they sent it up to us by Overnight Express in a single truck with two drivers. They had to hoist it out the window and down two stories. And you wouldn't think that a stuffy old men's club, very um, Republican club, would do this kind of thing. But they need to do things once in a while for the public good and to look good. And their president was a friend of a friend. And um, they did it. We couldn't believe it. It was really great. It was kind of a last minute thing, too. All of a sudden, it, they said, we're going to do it. And they sent it up by truck. It's kind of scary. This is that painting. Um, <laughs> William Keith did a whole set of these large paintings to show the environment of the areas um, that he was portraying, different parts of California. And for me, this painting is all about Manzanita. So if you look at this picture, this is the center of that picture with a horseback. And look at the Manzanita. You can almost feel what it's like to go through that scrub. All of you who are hikers and get caught up in the Manzanita know what we're talking about, that, that uh, it's got that, that gnarly feel. And this is texture. I really like. I really like this. So I mentioned before to look at the paints in William Keith's paint box. This is um, on the back of this picture by Harry Cassie Best, and an art historian of California art would look at this picture and say that's by William Keith, but it's not. And I found a reference to three paintings by Harry Cassie Best that were painted while Harry Cassie Best was painting with William Keith. And on the back of this painting, it's on the artist's board, it says, don't sell. And these are all the secret mixing, you know, the mixing secrets of colors that William Keith taught to Harry Cassie Best. So it says down here, add sepia for distant trees. Fine uh, for some foliage, I think for foliage glaze. And if you look at the painting and you look in the center here, you can kind of see these different gradings of shade. Well, the, that line maybe gives you the secret on how to get that effect. So this is actually you know, a pretty interesting picture. 
not only you know is it a, a beautiful painting, but it's got those secrets embedded in the back of it. And I think the artist himself best didn't want to get rid of that. He wanted to keep those notes. So just this is a side note. The president Theodore Roosevelt wrote, Mr. Best, that painting we just saw was by Best. Dear sir, I appreciate very much your painting after glow on Mount Shasta and shall give it the place of honor in my home. I consider the evening twilight on Mount Shasta one of the grandest sights I have ever witnessed. Kindest regards to Mrs. Best and little Virginia Best, yours truly, Theodore Roosevelt. Now all these people are interlinked in a lot of ways. So Virginia Best here married uh, Ansel Adams and Ansel Adams took over Harry Cassie Best's studio in Yosemite. So it became the Ansel Adams studio, those kind of things. Thomas Hill was the other man. There was William Keith and Thomas Hill were really the most prolific and best known of the early California San Francisco art boom painters. So this is Thomas Hill's picture of Sissons. And Thomas Hill was a good friend of Sisson and would stop in when, as he traveled through. It says Sissons over here. And uh, this is a, a great painting of, of Sissons. And you know, I'm gonna say around 1880 or so, this is Thomas Hill's painting. The Mount Shasta um, Museum owns this painting by Thomas Hill. Um, it's incredibly lifelike. You walk around and, and the eyes follow you. It's got that, that kind of eerie presence. So you get a real sense of who Sisson was. Um, that quote by Ludlow, you know he was a great shot. Sisson was a great mountaineer, took a lot of people up uh, onto the summit of Mount Shasta. So here we've got local history and we've got fine art all wrapped up in one picture. Um, this is a, another Thomas Hill painting of Sissons and Black Butte and the Rabbits by Hill. This comes from picturesque California. It was a Thomas, Thomas Hill was hired by John Muir because John Muir was the editor of a big series of magazines finally compiled as a single book called Picturesque California. And it portrayed the different regions of California Thomas Hill did about 10 pictures for that. And these grouse, I don't know if any of you have encountered them up on the mountain, but this looks like it's Sergeant's Ridge up here to me. And uh, it's up in the game region of Mount Shasta, Mount Grouse by Thomas Hill. You know, dozens of, of Mount Shasta paintings by Thomas Hill. This is up, Nauawa, it's called Nauawa by Thomas Hill. And this is a grizzly being shot by these native peoples here and hunters here above McLeod. So the McLeod River is down in this area. And this went into picturesque California as an example of the game regions of um, Mount Shasta. Another Thomas Hill, you can see down here, the artist is painting um, Black Butte and probably um, an attempt to portray in the distance Mount McLaughlin and probably a rather large version of Castle Lake, in my opinion. Um, so there are those, those two artists, William Keith, Thomas Hill, dozens and dozens of Mount Shasta pictures. And the other artists who were fairly successful, maybe second tier artists like Frederick Schaefer also did a lot of Mount Shasta pictures. So I'm just gonna go through some. Here's a picture of Schaefer. Um, he did 5,000 paintings or something like that. Not a Mount Shasta, but he did uh, 80 pictures. This is one of three pages, all Mount Shasta pictures. There's a professor emeritus of computer studies at MIT who is is fanatic about the paintings of Frederick Schaefer. So just a few of them. There's some, they really kind of give you a, a, that wide open feel that I like so much. Um, James Everett Stewart was another artist in the time period. Um, Mount Shasta from the north side there in Shasta Valley. Here's Stewart. Here's another Stewart, 1885. You get the idea. Um, Stewart also was an acquaintance of Joaquin Miller when Joaquin Miller, who did the Sudden, Sudden and Solitary, became famous. He became quite famous in England and then became famous in the US for the Life Amongst the Modocs book. And um, there's a, a woman's figure in the smoke here. He was quite a ladies man. Miller was being followed by women all over San Francisco when they were doing this portrait. So Stewart kind of put that little hidden secret note in there. And this is a famous portrait it's owned by the um, State Library in uh, Sacramento. But again, it's Stuart. I may, he may have gotten associated to Mount Shasta through, through Miller. James Everett Stuart again. Um, this is a later painting. This is like, and uh, 
it um, it's kind of startling, but I like it. Now the color is allowing me to segue into the fish painting. But, uh, so the Dolly Varden, which is now um, extirpated, I think that's the word, it doesn't exist anymore in California. And through a series of namings, it's it, it's called the bull trout now, but it used to live in the McLeod and it was quite, quite famous. And Samuel Martin Brooks was hired by the Smithsonian to paint the Dolly Varden because when they were, they didn't really know what these fish looked like in different life cycles. And so this was a scientific expedition that came up to uh, the McLeod River and 1876 San Francisco Chronicle, Brooks and Deacon, these are two artists, um, we just saw the fish by Brooks, have returned from Mount Chast and are hard at work upon the material obtained during their short trip. Brooks has some fine specimens of Dolly Varden trout upon his canvas and has also finished uh, for Professor Baird of the Smithsonian Institute an accurate picture of a salmon in spawning time. During this process, the, big, the fish changes its color, et cetera. So I, was, I saw this, the man that had Albert Bierstadt showed me this um, in San Francisco when I first started looking. And years later, that little painting came up for auction at an obscure auction house down in Alameda, Alameda um, off of Oakland. So I went down and I bought the painting. This is Brooks painting. And this is a painting by Edward Deacon. Now Deacon's the other artist in that article. This is Brooks, it's a pretty hardy guy. Here's the, the uh, Dolly Varden painting. And if you look at the right, I and mean, there's a lot to learn about paintings. The Oakland Museum owned this painting. They started to clean it and they got halfway and said, it looks, doesn't look like that great a painting. Let's just stop there and deaccession it. So I think that's what happened. Let's see. Uh -huh. So this is the Edward Deacon painting that's mentioned in that article, in my opinion. I, I can't imagine Deacon having done more than one. This is a large painting and is very detailed. Again, it looks pretty awkward because we're used to looking every day at the mountain. But if you don't know, that's Mount Chasta. It's obvious and it's a very well done, well executed painting from 1876. Now it reminded me of this painting and this was the second painting, this was the first painting that, that the publishers in San Francisco for the Sudden and Solitary book, they wanted to put this picture on the cover. And I said, you know, every time I look at it, I'll cringe because it looks so awkward. So they said, well, we don't want to make you cringe. So we'll use the other picture that I recommended, which they did do. But on the other hand, this maybe would have been better, more sales, who knows? It's kind of a, uh, it's rather dramatic. Eliza Barkas, this is a picture of her. She was from Portland. She made her living and raised, I don't know how many, nine children or something like that, solely through her artwork. So she did thousands of paintings and maybe several hundred Mount Shasta paintings. She would just really um, create them quickly and sell lots and lots. She was a hardworking person. Another woman, just a couple of the, of the better known women artists of the era is Grace Fountain. She was born in Wairica, moved to Ashland, then to Oakland. And this painting um, from 1934, later in her life was hanging down at Cal's books. If any of you know Cal and Cal's books, um, back in probably 87, I saw it down there all covered in dirt, just hanging kind of draped over a, a curtain rod. And I asked him, you know, if you wanted to sell it, he said, yeah, I want to sell it. And so I bought it from, it was so dirty. I used a hand gum eraser and written seven feet high and six feet wide. It took me like a week. I hand erased it to clean it up. Um, there's tricks for cleaning and that one worked the best. And I had Ralph Starrett up in Wairika um, put it on a, a frame or a stretcher bar. And now Turtle Bay owns it. They had a wonderful frame built for it, conserved it very well. It's a huge painting. Um, it actually goes down more than shown here. Here's a picture in a Grace uh, Fountain in Oakland, in um, uh, Ashland as a young girl. So, and she did lots of paintings and they're, they're all out there too. Okay, one more, another Grace uh, Fountain painting of Mount Shasta. You know, they, you kind of get the idea. <laughs> they did a lot of paintings of Mount Shasta. So finally, Henry Joseph Brewer, this is uh, 1903. I'm gonna show you the picture. Oh, I might not even have the picture, sorry to say. Um, but this is worth, worth um, stating anyway, I boarded a train to some station somewhere near Mount Shasta and thus into the woods. 
The days were grand before that high white altar Shasta. I shall feel for all my life that I was a true pilgrim, and for the sake of days like that, I am happy to be what I am, a landscape painter. I can assure you it is nine tenths hard work and physical endurance. In my choice of subjects, I am unfortunately so fortunate as to choose the grand and big and strong. Therefore, I have often to travel far and endure much, but the game is worth the effort, and a trophy brought in by my brush is worth more to me than a big kill of mountain sheep or antlered elk. So that's Henry Joseph Brewer. Sorry, I don't have the picture. It should be in here somewhere, but now, now not working. Hang on. There we go. Samuel Parrott was a teacher of um, Eliza Barkas. So I got things mixed up a little bit there. Just a few more paintings from the era. This is probably around 1890. Um, Gillette Holdridge, I love this painting. I love these, these little kids. It shows you what an artist can do with just a few marks. And, and kind of get a sense of play. William Armstrong, Hiram Bloomer. Um, this is a local collector's little painting and he asked me if I knew who it was and I wasn't sure, but I now think it was this Hiram Bloomer. But this, these little things on this, all this spotty on there is cedar. It's a uh, cigar boxes were used by art, artists a lot as um, kind of a, uh, a back, backing for their paintings. Let's see. Okay, um, Carlos Hittel, this is my favorite painting. The, the Boggs collection is a big collection of art by the woman who saved Shasta City from being torn down piece by piece for bricks to take to Reading. She stopped that process and um, she was an art collector. And so her entire collection of several hundred paintings is down at the Courthouse Museum. So you drive through going out to the coast and drive through Shasta City, the Courthouse Museum, check it out sometime. It's really pretty amazing. We want to see some, some interesting paintings. Um, Thaddeus Welsh was um, self-taught and then finally went, a lot of these artists went to Europe. The Calistota wagons are pretty much true to the time. This was painted in 1874 and he said that um, in 1874, he said no other incident, he's talking about something that happened and, and to disturb my happy dreams until my bet noir, which means his black beast, Penury was again on my track and I saw I must give Shasta a rest while I took a walk to Wairika to see how the printing business was flourishing. He was a printer. But there was no show for a stranger and the prospect commenced to look pretty blue. Wandering around without a nickel among strangers, I had about come to the conclusion that an artist's life is not what it is cracked up to be. And I'm sure that was true for most of the artists. Only a few really got to be successful. Ah, this is the Henry Joseph Brewer, the big game. Sorry, that was out. So now let's see, what time is it? Yeah, we're doing still all right. The Wilkes Expedition, the first images of Mount Shasta. And I'll go through this quickly. Um, in 1987, I was in San Francisco at a rare bookstore and I asked the proprietor if they had any pictures, engravings of Mount Shasta. I was looking for the earliest pictures. She said, no, but you're welcome to look around. And so I found this little pamphlet from 1849 and it said that this was a picture from an 1841 expedition. So I wanna go through the Wilkes expedition. We'll just do five minutes. We'll do the abbreviated version. Around the world, 1838, each color here is a different year. 1838, 1839's orange, yellows, 1840. In 1841, this group of ships and 400 plus men came to the Columbia River. And one of their big ships, the Peacock it was called, it crashed. So they spent a year exploring in that area and they sent an overland expedition at the end of this year time period of five of the great uh, scientifics that were with them. There really was a science expedition and they were you know, mapping, ostensibly they were mapping um, the environment and the science and the natives, but they were really spying um, on California because the British thought California, the Americans thought that California was going to be given to the British. And um, they were planning for the war with Mexico, which happened a few years afterwards. So this whole expedition, I thought this was appropriate. A man named Sims had this idea that there was a hollow earth. This is, a, this is his globe that showed the hollow earth at the top of the Arctic. And they wanted in 1820s, they wanted to send an expedition out to see whether the earth was hollow or not. And this Wilkes expedition really grew out of the funds that were appropriated to feed this idea. 
And then it became a more sensible um, project and they mapped the South Pacific. The Wilkes Expedition, this group of men, um, one of them that came to Mount Shasta was the first one to see land on the Antarctic and they kind of claimed the Antarctic as a continent for the first time to science. So Wilkes was the leader of the expedition. He did not come to Mount Shasta. These guys did, these were kind of the, the, the scientists. Um, they came, there were I think 36 people and 70 or so horses. Emmons led it, Eld was the topographer, Agate was the professional artist, Brackenridge who picked up the Darlingtonia Californica, the, the pitcher plant, California pitcher plant. That was their, out of 10,000 specimens of, of botany that they brought back, that was his favorite and the expedition's biggest find. Dana was the geologist, Peel was another famous artist from, and naturalist uh, from the famous Peel family. From Philadelphia. So I just wanted to show you, I didn't really go in all the places that I got, I've gotten to go to, but this is the Beinecke Library at Yale where all of the journals of the Wilkes expedition are held. And this box, it's, a, it's like a shell of a building and the rare books are held in this box. And in the event of a fire, the entire box fills up with um, some gases that are non-combustible. And you know, extinguishes all oxygen, forces it out. So it's a very um, purpose-built building. And it's one of, you know, 10 buildings that I've been to during the course of my, my scholarship that just blow my mind architecturally. There's some interesting places, not least of which was the National Archives, because you get in, you press the button to go to the 11th floor and the elevator goes down. And then you realize, oh, that's right. There's only two stories outside and there's 11 stories are all these old cages from the 1840s holding all the Wilkes uh, expedition materials. And that, that was interesting too. Lots of places, lots of adventure in terms of, of buildings and architecture for housing books and artwork. So that was fun. This is one, one page. Every day the topographer drew a picture. Destruction River was their name for the upper Sacramento, the South Shore probably, um, Mount Shasta, Shasti Peak is up on top. Um, called destruction because they found big areas where wind had blown all the trees down. The needles down here is the Castle Crags area. Highly, highly detailed journals. The, the lost legacy of this expedition, especially in Mount Shasta materials, was helped by this unfortunate event in terms of the actual explorers. When they left the ship after four years, all their souvenirs and all their journals, which were supposed to be kept fairly highly accurate, were confiscated from them. They, they, Wilkes was kind of a dictator and he took everything and, and um, used, used all those journals to write up the reports later on. Um, this is James Dwight Dana's original drawing. You could say this is one of the first pictures of Mount Shasta, Pine Forest on the right, um, pencil drawing, Castle Ball Ridge, Avalanche Gulch, Dillard Canyon, the S stands for snow patches. You know, as you look at it, you begin to see that he wasn't a great artist, but he was capturing, you know, details that he found important. Um, this is the very first picture of Mount Shasta ever produced in terms of fine art. And this was then reprinted as an engraving in 1844, the first time it was ever published, a picture of Mount Shasta. But this is from 1841 and Agate, um, was a botanical artist. So you look at the sugar pine and the text will talk about how the sugar pines were hollowed out, burned out by the Indians and the, and the sugar was actually, the resin was used as a sugar. All the men on the expedition tried it, they all got sick, um, but the Indians loved it. Uh, the, um, this looks like a ponderosa here, sugar pine back there. And um, this looks more like the sugar pine to me, but let's um, go on with that. These bows and arrows were taken to the Smithsonian, the skins were taken to the Smithsonian, the way the hair was worn, everything on this, the, the Manzanita um, system, the flat roots, everything in here was meant to accompany text that talked about these things. So this is not just an artistic picture. This was done for scientists. He, he did like, oh, maybe 140 pictures for the entire expedition over four years that were published. Uh, here's a close up. So you're really looking through the eyes of an artist in 1841, seeing what the bow and arrow looked like, seeing what the skins looked like, seeing how it was worn. It's very genuine stuff for us here. And, and um, you know, in terms of ethnology, 
they took the Shasta Indian vocabulary. They had a list of 100 words and they did it all over the world, the same 100 words and all of those were compiled up into a report at the end of uh, 20 years of report writing from that expedition. Here's a Shasti hut by Agate. This is a floor plan of Sutter's Butte. This is Peel's picture of Sutter's Fort. They wanted to know, and the Sutter's Fort was used by the Americans. They imprisoned uh, house arrest Sutter during 1846 uh, war with Mexico. And um, they had all the, full, the, you know, these are the floor plans showing you where everything is in Sutter's Fort from 1841. And five years later, they used those plans when they went to war with Mexico. Sad, but true. Bill, can I stop you for just a second? To, sure, yeah. So um, a question from Mark Williams about where is the library that you mentioned, Mark, I think you're talking about the Wilk, Wilkes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, that that unusual building, the Beinecke Library, is at Yale. I'm sorry, Yale University, and uh, it's an out of place building. It's an old Gothic, you know, architecture for Yale University. And right there in the middle of one big courtyard is this odd building, and you go inside, and it's the Rare Book Library. So it's at Yale, New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, this is just the science that was published. Uh, you know, all the way in 57, they, they were doing all these things, um, ethnography and philology that I was talking about, the narratives the, in which the first pictures of Mount Shasta, et cetera. So shells, geology, you know, there's great quotes about Mount Shasta in here. Big shelf full of books. Um, you know, you talk about climate change, they took every hour or so, they took a temperature reading. So they mapped where everywhere they, you know, they kind of extrapolated, but they took, this is the hot zone right there. They took readings. I mean, they were, they were true scientists in every, every minute of their lives. The Darlingtonia, this is the actual um, picture plant that was taken in 1841, still in the Smithsonian. Um, this book was published by the Smithsonian in honor of the Wilkes expedition and the founding of the Smithsonian. There's the Smithsonian. So we have, you know, we, we have the Smithsonian due to this Wilkes expedition and we also have some pictures of Mount Shasta. So it's an amazing body of maps and descriptions and science about Mount Shasta region in 1841, which is really early for any material about California. So it's a great thing. So last, last section here, the Whitney Glacier, I'll go through this pretty quick. It's pretty easy. Um, art and irony, the idea here um, is that the Whitney Glacier was not named in honor of uh, um, Josiah Dwight Whitney, as I thought. It was named for him, but it was kind of in spite of him in a certain way. So here's the Whitney Glacier on a topo topographical map going northward there. The Whitney Glacier starts there. And if you look right over here, you've got Clarence King Lake. So Clarence King named the Whitney Glacier, but why did he name it? Well, it has to do with this rivalry that King, and if you look over here on the right of John Muir, John Muir kind of supposed that maybe Yosemite was carved by glaciers. King agreed. The two of them kind of had a, um, you know, an accommodation between them on that. Whitney thought it was hogwash and almost publicly mocked King and Muir about these ideas of there being glaciers in California, especially glaciers that could have um, carved out Yosemite. Mm -hmm. Whitney thought that the whole floor just dropped and then an upheaval took place around the sides of it. Um, and it was a big argument. And because King had been publicly mocked by Whitney, and here's, the, here's kind of some of the wording, Whitney mocked the glacial ideas of King and Muir, quote, a more absurd theory was never advanced than that by which it was thought to ascribe to glaciers the sawing of these vertical walls and the rounding of domes, no proof, so that this theory based on entire ignorance of the whole subject, here are all idiots, may be dropped without any wasting any more time about it, you know, upon it. So, so what did King call his newly discovered glacier when King, you know, came to Mount Shasta in, 1870, it's his second trip there and saw the glacier for the first time. And it, it said in a new book by Tyler Green, that's why I, I just found out about this. Um, it's called Clarence, uh, it's called Carlson Watkins on photography. That's what the artwork we're gonna see in a minute. Um, so anyway, in his sketchbook, according to Tyler Green, Whitney right away said, Whitney Glacier, you know, kind of mocking Whitney saying, oh, no glaciers in California. Hey, I'll name one for you, this is brilliant. And in order to prove something like there are glaciers on Chasta, oh yeah, prove it. 
Well, the way King proved it was to get Carlton Watkins, the most famous photographer of that era and maybe the most accomplished of early California photographers or American photographers, was with them, hired you know, specifically by King to document what they were finding. And this is the famous painting of commencement of the Whitney Glacier that proved to the world in no uncertain terms that there were glaciers in the continental United States. And this is the first one so discovered. Yeah, I just wanted to, you know, another missing little piece of this puzzle. In 1866, Chauncey, a climber um, from the area in the Wairika Journal says, the large ravine which lies between the main peak and the crater on the northwest holds at its head a grand and extensive glacier of ice and snow. They accumulate snows of 100 winters from either side of the mountain, etc. So the locals, you know, it's no big deal to them. The glacier on Mount Shannon, of course, there's a glacier there. But to science and to King, it was news. And um, he gets the credit for discovery. And even though those people that have been standing on it all along would say otherwise. Just to show you kind of what the 40th parallel survey was, this is Clarence King at the head here. They're going across from um, Utah all the way to California border. And in 1870, they had money left over. So uh, at the end of the season, and in October, King with a few of his trusted um, topographers came up to Mount Shasta and that's when they discovered the glaciers. But the entire 40th parallel survey that King put together, way bigger than anything uh, Josiah Whitney had ever done, you know, and the science was so impeccable that King became the first chief of the United States Geological Survey after this, um, this 40th parallel survey work. Now at Mount Shasta, this is a famous picture of Gilbert Munger, the artist, was taught to paint uh, pictures along their Mount Shasta and Mount Rainier escapades. Uh, this is Munger sitting there. And up here is Carlton Watkins. And as I said, Carlton Watkins was probably the most famous of the early California and American photographers. And um, there's a Munger painting of Mount Shasta. I just found this a couple of days ago. It um, was in an art um, website and another one from the east side of Mount Shasta very similar to Carlton Watkins. Uh, Whitney was an artist. I, I tried to, to bring in the artistry to show you that these guys, Whitney, this is Clarence King, uh, Mount Shasta. This is John Muir's Mount Shasta. You know, most people, when they hear of sketches of Mount Shasta, they think of his writing that was called Sketches of Mount Shasta or Mount Shasta Sketches. But these arrows show the glaciation. John Muir came to Mount Shasta after King and um, wanted to see for himself how glaciation affected this mountain to help prove his own theories. So, you know, Muir and Whitney and King, they, they all were sketching. And this is Carlton Watkins showing you something really impressive. Um, I think he's up on Gray Butte looking atop of Panther View. You know, Panther Meadows would be over here. And the old ski bowl is up in this area. This is Green Butte. So you're going up Sar West Fork of Sergeant's Ridge and you go on up uh, to the summit up Sergeant's Ridge. And um, these pictures really were in, in the service of science. I think that's the point. And they're artistic at the same time. They're just phenomenally, and there's probably 20 to 30 master photographs by Carlton Watkins. And they're really a baseline, you know, for referral now to see how glaciation or how just weathering erosion has taken place. So that's it pretty much. Just a few fun pictures here. I love this picture. It shows the heart up there by Thumb Rock and the Red Banks. Um, pretty good logging trucks and kids and dogs with their shadows and moms and kids and just a, a genre scene from the 50s. This is a Percy Gray from 1925. He's a watercolorist. This, just, this is like the 20th century stuff. We're almost done. Um, just a few pictures, the Shasta root in colors. And then finally, I'll leave it here. One of the things you don't often see is that the animals in our world are looking at us all the time, warily more often than not. And we don't usually see them looking back at us, but um, this Earl Lamb painting of Mount Shasta, he was a local artist, uh, you know, primitive artist, they call it, um, kind of captured the timber wolves at Mount Shasta. So on that, um, I'm gonna leave it, that's it. All right, Bill. Well, thanks so much. That was an amazing tour of Mount Shasta history, and I really appreciated seeing um, so many of the paintings. So we do have a few questions for you. 
Yep. So um, I'll start reading through those and we'll see if we get some more um, that come up. And um, for those of you that I'll be reading your questions to Bill, if you have anything you want to follow up, um, just put it in the chat window. Mark Williams asks, are the caves northwest or northeast of Mount Shasta? So that would be northwest of Mount Shasta. Northeast. Did I say northwest? Yeah, maybe. Uh, northeast of Mount Shasta, yeah. The uh, Modoc lava beds, you go up Highway 97, um, almost to the Oregon border, and then you go east. So I, I don't, I forget what I said, but yeah, there you go. Okay, thank you. And let's see. Mark also asks, what's the year of the very colorful James Stewart painting of Mount Shasta? Yeah, I'm not positive. I'm going to say around 1922, 23, something in the 1920s, though. It's very late in his career, and he did a lot of them. I've seen about 10 of those almost identical paintings that he did. They must have sold well, and they were easy to paint. Yeah, pretty amazing to think that there were folks making so many paintings. OK. Yeah. Um, let's see, we've got a couple more questions coming through. Um, let's see, you were so fortunate to find that sketch that appears to have been for that painting you found by chance in Pasadena. Where did you find oh. that sketch? Yeah, the sketch. So, so the museum, of, it's called the Oakland Museum of Art in Oakland, started collecting early California art in the 1920s, because by then it was still, you know, older art, the 1860s, 1870s, you know, in 1925, they were pretty aware of the importance of these early paintings. And so they collected a huge collection of, of artwork and sketchbooks and all that stuff is kind of in storage. But at the time I went there to look at their collection, just what was on the walls, they had a, um, display case and it was opened up and it said Mount Shasta magic wonderful and it was a drawing of Mount Shasta and I explained to their librarian what I was doing and they took me upstairs back to that case opened it up and we went through all 15 pages and it was all from the oh, I think it was August 1876 um, and um, I, saw, I recognized immediately that one that was kind of similar to the Pasadena painting that I had bought in Pasadena. And that was great. And they, they did photographs for me. They even gave me a, like a, a fairly hard to find um, history of early California art. They had a duplicate of it. And so they were very, very helpful. And uh, it was great, yeah. Bill, do you think it's still possible today to have some of these experiences you had where you went into a gallery and people didn't realize what they had? Or do you feel like this Mount Shasta art has gotten enough attention now that... Yeah, I, I think that there, it's, that was 30 years ago and it was, it was easier at the time, but I think you can still find things, um, but you kind of have to go to yard sales and uh, in really small antique stores. You know, with the internet, that's the problem from that standpoint is that everybody can look up what they have or what a shop has or, you know, so they can go in, they can write down the name. And I mean, I see people all the time just looking up stuff just on their cell phone. They don't even bother to hide it, you know, just to see what the values are. So it's, it's harder now to find things. I will say this, uh, one mistake I made early on, um, I went to an antique store down in Berkeley at a corner on uh, Shattuck Avenue and looked in the window and there was a painting by um, a woman named Redding, R-E-A-D-I-N-G. It was really Pearson B. Redding's daughter. And she did a painting of Mount Lassen. It was really interesting. And it was in the window and it was a Sunday. I was closed. I went back the next morning and I went into the shop and said, I want to buy this painting if I can. It's, you know, and it was a real reasonable price. And um, I was just overjoyed. And this other collector came in, we stuck up a conversation and I started bragging about this great find that I just had made in the store. But I'm talking right in front of the owner who's selling me this treasure for nothing. And, <laughs> and he's saying, I didn't know that. I didn't know that because it was really um, a piece of Shasta County history, Redding's history. 
Um, the woman grew up on Rancho Buena Ventura back in the 1880s. And, you know, it was a treasure. And yet I'm kind of bragging about finding a treasure at this guy's store while he's still, still in the store as the owner. And so you kind of got to be discreet because you don't want to make people feel bad. And um, so that, that kind of thing can happen. And it happened to me anyway. Yeah, thanks. I have a question for you from Christine. She says, it sounds like there were only one or two women painters of Mount Shasta. Were there others? You know, I, I have, there are um, a few, but I, you know, I was scratching my brains trying to find the picture that, um, you know, I sold my whole collection of paintings to the earlier museum iteration of it. And uh, one of that big painting by Grace Fountain is just an amazing painting. It's huge. It's really cool. Um, but I, you know, I don't even have a good picture of it anymore. But I couldn't think of too many women artists. You know, I put a chapter in my um, original paper on women artists of Mount Shasta, and I have to go back there and look and see see who else. Um, but there are only three that I can think of, and um, yeah. Maybe if I find something else, I'll, I'll send it to the land trust and you can put it on with the notes for this talk. Yeah. Sounds good. And uh, Karen Pores passed us all the tips the next time we're traveling. She says that in uh, Joe's Cafe in Santa Barbara, there's a huge painting of Mount Shasta. All right. No, I haven't. You know, that's the thing. Uh, there's, there's paintings in buildings still. Um, and, you, you know, you never would know it. Um, unless somebody like Karen tells you. So yeah, I'll go check that out someday when I'm down there. All right, Joe's Cafe. You know, I, uh, I um, was talking to um, a guy at um, what's now the Black Bear Diner. I think, I forget what it was. It might've been Wendy's, not Wendy's, it was something. Um, and, and I was telling him what I was doing. He said, hey, you know, in the Shelton House um, down on Mount Shasta Boulevard, the Shelton House, I think it is. Um, that the engineering, Schlumberger's engineering is in. Well, the guy says, you know, he owned the building and, and he said, you know, down in the basement, there's a big old painting in Mount Shasta. So we went over and looked at it and uh, he sold it to me for a real reasonable price. And it's 12 feet wide, <laughs> four feet high. And it hangs in, the, in one of the rooms at the Mount Shasta System Museum now. Wow. Uh, so, uh, you know, there, there's stuff out there. Yeah, it can still happen, but it's it's harder to find. When I first started looking, you know, I was finding paintings every couple of days. So it was, it was amazing. Wow. Well, Bill, thanks again. It, it looks like um, we don't have any more questions coming in right now, but we have a lot of comments from folks who have really enjoyed the presentation tonight. And so I want to say thank you again for, um, for putting this on for us tonight and um, walking us through so much history and um, great, to, great to see all of that. Um, for folks who are um, still with us in the chat, Kim had posted a couple of links that you can follow up on. And also there are a bunch of resources that Bill shared related to this webinar that are on the Siskiyou Land Trust website. So you can go there and um, and look at some of those references if you've got some things here that you want to follow up on. So um, Bill, unless you have anything else to add for the evening, I think we're about ready to sign off. No, let's sign. The last thing I want to say, you know, this whole project, um, although, you know, I, I had personal reasons for doing it, um, the idea of documenting through the artwork um, the significance of the mountain as a resource, as a visual resource, something not to really be taken lightly and tampered with is an important one. You know, it's a good method, I think, for, for helping save places because people will do anything, you know, um, build a ski area or build an airport or whatever on top of the mountain, who knows. Um, so I think, you know, other places too could, could stand the same kind of um, process, you know, it's it's the mountain as a whole has a history, which is yeah. not a not a normal way of looking at things. Yeah, it's a great point, Bill. You know, so much of the conservation work that the land trust does when we're working to place conservation easements on properties, part of that is maintaining the visual landscape that we are used to seeing and that we associate with this area. You know, you think of 
Rainbow Ridge as a forested ridge line. And that can continue to be the case in the future, but if that those properties are subdivided, it can also become a place with houses on it. And so that whole yeah. conversation around just what we think our landscape looks like and how that can change over time to me is really interesting. As someone that I, you know, grew up here and have never left, I have seen the landscape change, and I'm certain that there are other folks who are sensitive to that and noticing those changes. So it's great to have this lens that you've given us to really think about think about this place that most of us live, but several people who've joined us here tonight um, are coming from other areas. So I do really appreciate um, your sharing this long journey that you've taken. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, it's great to share. Yeah. So thanks to everyone. Take good care of yourselves out there. And we will see you again December 8th for our next slideshow. Everyone have a good night. Good night. All right. Thanks again, Bill. All right.